Uh, it's different than most economics books. This is not a book of the moment. This is really a story of what happened to us since 1970, or really a little bit before 1970. And it's hard to ca capsulize, it's hard to encapsulate, I should say, the few main points. But this is what I want, the messages I want to leave. And I usually wait till the end, but I want to get them in at the beginning, because I'll no doubt not get to all of them or forget them by the time we get to the end. Individuals made the credit crisis in Great Recession of 2008, 2007, 2008, and 2009 happen. They made the difficult economic times I described and will continue to describe since the early 1970s happen. They were not acts of God, they were not acts of nature, and they were not inevitable. Individuals made them, and this book focuses on individuals, how people make history. One of the things that upsets me most is that I, I, I think it, that there are two spheres in social life, and I've used this metaphor before and it seems to work according to people. One sphere is the competition business sphere. The other sphere is the cooperation general good sphere. What you notice happening over this history is that the competition business sphere started to go bigger and nudge aside the cooperation general good sphere. Now, the competition, this wasn't done unconsciously. Those who advocated more extremely the advantages of the competition business sphere, free markets, claimed that would create social justice. We didn't have to worry about cooperation. And, and the general good. I'm going to get back to that because, in fact, America worked best when these two spheres overlapped. And I want to get the, back to that at the end because I think the nations that will thrive in the next century are the ones who understand those spheres will overlap. And maybe I'll be able to talk about a couple of examples uh, uh, in, this, uh, 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 in American history. I want to make clear that the damage done by what this age of greed, the damage done by individuals and then the systemic reactions to them, did not all occur in 2007-2008. Damage has been done since the 1970s. And I mean something very specific about that. Not only levels of unemployment and so forth, but persistent misallocation of precious resources, persistent misallocation of capital. One of the other interesting things about this age of greed is it reversed history. We learned how to deal with some of the problems we had recently in the 1930s. We created very useful regulations. Some of those regulations got outdated. Many of them didn't, but in spirit, all of them should have been maintained, and in spirit, many if not most of them were undermined. We reversed history. And finally, it was, I have two finalists, it was the abdication of government responsibility that led to these crises and these difficult economic times. Pure and simple. One last point, economic ignorance. There was remarkable economic ignorance over this time, not merely by those of us who occasionally write in the media, but by the so-called best economists in the nation. The, while many people are stepping forward to claim on the left and the right that they actually predicted this financial crisis, I don't think anybody fully predicted this crisis uh, or even remotely predicted this crisis. There are a couple of names that stand out and maybe they deserve credit, but they predicted it for other reasons, I would argue. The economics profession did not know, for the most part, what was going on. And while many thought there was a housing bubble and the housing market would crash and the crash in house prices would lead to some kind of recession, none of them thought it would be more than a modest recession. They didn't get the link between the economy and finance. As I say, however, this is a story. So let's begin at the beginning, or maybe let's begin at my beginning, because I think I got most interested in this as a story because it more or less started when I got out of school. I was a witness, I think, to this history. When I was in school and, I, and, and got out in the early 1970s, nobody, I mean literally nobody, could imagine what was going to happen to financial markets then. Quite the contrary. There was one professor 
where I, at one of the schools I went to, who would tell all the students, you know, if you spend $5,000 today, you're giving up $500,000 in 20 years, because you could have invested that $5,000 in the stock market. We're talking about the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. And it would grow a compound interest rate, I don't know what the going rate was then, 9 or 10%, and here is the power of compound interest. People believed the equity markets, the stock market, would keep growing. There was a famous futurist, watch out for the word futurist, some of them still had credibility, I'm always shocked by that, named Herman Kahn, remember him? He said in 1967, I think, for the first time, productivity, which is the great source of economic growth and a rising standard of living, productivity would grow by 4% in the next 20 years, 4% a year, not the mere 3% it grew in the stunning growth period of the 1950s and 1960s. He was dead wrong. Productivity slowed down to about 1% a year. Stunning economists, inexplicable to this day. We entered the 1970s with one other thought firmly in mind. We had conquered recession. This was the Keynesian promise. Now I am, was a Keynesian as a student, and I am a Keynesian. But the promise was too strongly made. And politics interfered. It wasn't so much the failure of Keynesian economics, but the failure to apply it equally in different kinds of circumstances. We thought we weren't going to have a serious recession again. Well, what happened in the 1970s? We had the worst recession in the post-World post War II history, 1973 to 1975, and a long one. And simultaneously, we had very high inflation. And suddenly, nobody could make sense of the markets. Equity prices, stock prices, basically stopped going up. They stopped going up for a decade. People, I think, sometimes forget that. You couldn't make money, for the most part, investing in stocks. And new kinds of securities were developed. Derivatives, as we, as we know. Securities based on other securities that required very little down payment to make the investment. Se securities based on interest rates, on commodities, on currency, international currencies. In that period, currencies were floated before they were fixed to the dollar and the dollar fixed to gold. That ended basically in 1971 and formally in 1973. Markets changed remarkably, and I could probably talk about this for the rest, for the rest of the talk, but people on Wall Street had to figure out new ways to make money. It radically changed the nature of things. One, there was one other big change, and maybe a still bigger one, back in the 1970s. The attitude of Americans towards government. I don't believe in monocausal explanations of history, but to me the big reason that Americans turned on average, and it, it showed up in the opinion surveys over this period, turned on average was the economic calamity of that age, the mess. Americans basically panicked, and so did both Republican and Democratic lawmakers in that year. So let me give you the brackets of that period to show how the attitude towards government changed. In 1972 and 1973, Ronald Reagan, governor of the state of California, in his second term, and he was a successful politician in California, he compromised much more than people thought, he believed he needed a more conservative legacy. He still wanted to run for president. He was talking about the presidential nomination back in 68 when Nixon run, ran. But he wanted a conservative legacy. And a couple of people came to him with an idea. It wasn't a new idea, but he presented it in a new way. Let's pass an, an amendment to cut income taxes in California. Not just for a year, not just for a moment, but permanently. Required an amendment to the state constitution. Got blown away. Californians refused to cut their state income taxes, even though the popular Ronald Reagan was pushing them to do that. Five years later, in 1973, recession struck, OPEC struck, raised oil prices, terrible crops. We had an institutional problem because wages, not only union wages, but all wages tended to be indexed to inflation and kept going up. Very hard to control inflation, even though there was a recession. In five years, Americans passed Proposition 13, Californians passed Proposition 13, uh, 
cutting property taxes sharply with, from my point of view, disastrous effects for the California education system ever since. It was the beginning of a tax revolt. States across the nation began cutting taxes, property taxes, income taxes, and so on, and through constitutional amendments. And there was a Kemp Roth bill that called for a 30% cut in income taxes that was gaining popularity in Congress. Jimmy Carter was very aware of that bill. He proposed a couple of tax cuts himself, and ultimately, Ronald Reagan adopted them. That was the crucible of change in America. That's when government became guilty until proven innocent. And that's when the age of deregulation and government mistrust began in earnest and spread and grew. And even today, when I speak to young people, or when I teach, there is a bias that was totally absent when I was in college, which is, why are we letting government interfere? What's going on here? Isn't government itself taking away our freedom? And then began the era of deregulation and neglect that led to this, uh, led to a variety of crises over the next 40 years. Into this new social attitude rushed many businessmen, economists, and, uh, and politicians. Let me tell you a little bit about Walter Riston. I suspect some of you remember the name Walter Riston, but I'm always reminded that uh, young people, in fact, I've been interviewed quite a few times recently, and people say to me, you brought up a guy named Walter Riston. I never heard of him. Uh, what did he do? It's always a little bit alien to somebody like me, because Walter Risson in the 70s was a household name. He built First National City Bank into Citicorp, the greatest bank from time to time of its time. Some exa Walter Riston uh, was born to a father who hated FDR. I think, you know, now my memory is getting pretty bad. There are more than a dozen facts in this book, and I'm starting to forget some of them. I think it was Henry Riston. He was an anti-New Deal intellectual. He eventually became the president of Wesleyan. And I think that, he, and I always find that kind of interesting, because I think uh, it's always interesting to find out where political ideologies come from. But Walter Riston wanted no part of business, wanted no part of the intellectual academic life. And he sort of got into banking by accident. And then he became very, very aggressive. One anecdote may be worth telling. Uh, I'm going to take a watch out here, because I already feel that I'm going to go on and on. <laughs> But one anecdote's worth telling. When Walter Riston was 27 or 28, and a, uh, and a, a young um, a bank officer, he got a client, he had a client named Aristotle Onassis. We're talking about the 1950s. Now many of you know, remember Aristotle Onassis as the fl flamboyant oil uh, uh, ship owner. And Onassis had an idea. Onassis needed the banks because he had to borrow money to build his ships. And he had an idea. Let's not, don't lend me money based on the collateral uh, of the ship. In other words, the resale value of the ship. Lend me money based on what I can earn by transporting this oil. This was a novel approach to oil tanker lending. And Riston leaped on it. And he convinced his superiors. And his career began. But Riston was a risk taker from the beginning, and some of those risks made good sense. Then he started getting a little bit out of hand. Let me give you an example of his, uh, uh, his um, basic assault on government, his contempt, really, for government regulation. One quick example. In the 1960s, he started something called a negotiable certificate of deposit. There was some, uh, something called Regulation Q from the New Deal legislation. Regulation Q limited interest rates on banks, that banks could pay savers, because they didn't want those banks to keep raising rates to attract savers and then make speculative investments. Banks were supposed to make safe investments. Now, this was not a new idea, and I should have written this down. Adam Smith actually had a line in The, uh, uh, in, uh, the Wealth of Nations in 1776 saying just that. Don't let banks pay too much, because they'll only go out and speculate your money away. It wasn't a new idea, obviously. But for Riston, it was a, a straitjacket. 
he wanted to get around it. So he had this idea about a negotiable CD. He would issue a note to, to other businesses and uh, pay a higher rate than Regulation Q because it wasn't a typical savings account. That note had to be negotiated just like any bond in the market, hence called negotiable. And I may be getting a little too technical here, but bear with me. Anybody else would have gone to the Federal Reserve and asked the Fed, can I do this? Not Riston. Riston said, let's do it and then let them try to stop us. And that defined Riston and that partly made him a hero in the business community ever since. He got around Regulation Q time and again in the 1970s. His greatest act of impunity, and there were many, was to uh, not wait for government to have a hand in the recirculation of the petrodollars of the 1970s. Wanted none of that. He would do it himself because his lending officers were brilliant, they knew the credit risks, and he began with the, the process of lending tens of billions of dollars of those petrodollars. In other words, the dollars the Arab oil countries made by raising OPEC. Uh, back then, people were scared to death they would figuratively put that money under their mattress. It would just disappear. Riston said, let's lend it to the third world. The smart thing would have been some kind of public-private partnership. In my own view, a public institution or two could have, or an ad hoc public institution could have managed it and given some of that money out as equity, not loans. Riston made loans based on the, va the value of commodities. You remember it was an inflationary period. For a while it looked great. The inflation of the commodity exports, tin and all that kind of thing. Just, inflation just kept driving those prices up. These guys did great. Riston had to be bailed out in 1982 because almost all the South American loans went bad. I, use, I, I go on about Riston at some length because he set the stage for this new age. A man ideologically angry at the F, what he considered FDR shackles on the financial industry. A man in power, a man of talent and articulateness and a man who could get along with the powers in Washington. And he did, in my view, damage to America. He tried to turn a bank into a growth company. Those days, IBM and Xerox and Johnson Johnson were the great growth companies. He did ongoing damage. That bank had to be bailed out three or four times over the course of its history. And Riston kept saying, our loan officers know what they're doing. Foreign countries never go bankrupt. Government keep out of our markets until we need them. What else happened in the 1970s? Well, you couldn't make money in stocks, so Wall Street had to figure out new ways to make money. It was the beginning of takeovers, hostile takeovers. Stock prices were so low it made sense to buy these companies. You could buy some companies for less than all the cash and accounts receivable they had. Uh, it looked like easy money. It was hard to change the industry, but it began to change in those years. And then all those derivatives products started developing. And the securitization of mortgages began to develop in the 70s. All of this to compensate for the lack of any rise in stock prices. At the same time, Milton Friedman rose to preeminence in economic circles. A man who was scoffed at only a few years earlier, certainly when I went to school, for the oversimplification of economics, became the leading economist of the day. And what was his message? Government keep out. Almost every product, every social product can be managed better in a free market. Almost. He made some exceptions. What, did Fre what was Friedman's main message? That circle I talked about, the competition circle, that would create social justice. Would there be labor prejudice? No. Businessmen are not silly enough not to hire people of color or women simply because they're people of color or women. If they're good enough to do the job, competition will eliminate prejudice in labor markets. One of his many claims that look foolish in retrospect, look foolish even then, but somehow that began to become, maybe not in labor markets, but the common sense of the land. Competition would create social justice 
and prosperity at the same time. With that economic idea, and it influenced Ronald Reagan, and the attitude of Americans towards government, deregulation needed only a few steps. I have a chapter on Milton Friedman in this book. The Democrats were infected. President Carter, who I think did some quite good things, was basically an economic conservative. Charlie Schultz, his chief economist, always said he wanted to balance the budget above all things. He also wanted to deregulate. Back then, airline prices and trucking prices were regulated. There was a reasonable argument to deregulate airlines and trucking, I think. There are two sides to that issue. Some people think it was foolish, others don't. I remember Ted Kennedy being an, uh, an avid advocate of the deregulation of airline fares. But Carter also wanted to deregulate finance. Kennedy got off the bus on that one. And he actually got rid of Regulation Q altogether, on a timetable, but altogether. That key piece of, uh, the key restriction that kept banks from getting too speculative. Um, in the, I, I want to talk for one second about what happened in banking, because that inflation that rose did not inhibit the banks from lending, because they learned how to keep raising the amount of money they paid savers and then lend at ever higher rates. So interest rates kept going up. Now you remember Henry Kaufman and Al Wojnalauer? They were known as Doctors Doom and Gloom. They kept saying, contrary to everybody else, every, most economists said, well, interest rates are going to go up and the economy is going to slow down. Not Kaufman and Wojnalauer, they knew better. Interest rates were no longer an inhibition on these financial institutions. The economy kept zooming ahead and overheating. Those two guys became legends, and their firms, First Boston and Solomon Brothers, made a fortune. That was the beginning of a remarkable change in American history. It followed through with Reagan and Volcker. The interesting thing about Volcker, uh, I think, was he didn't really believe in Friedman's monetarism, but he sure believed he had to stop that uh, inflation and stop it hard. He believed, I believe, he believed, he doesn't fully admit this, that the only way to stop it was a full-fledged deep recession. And he was appointed by Jimmy Carter. Carter, I don't think, fully believed he would go the full route, which is to raise interest rates very sharply, but he did. Nevertheless, I think Carter liked the idea a little bit. He was a conservative moralist in economic thinking. The fascinating thing about Volcker, however, was Ronald Reagan supported him enthusiastically, even while he cut taxes and created that big deficit that Volcker hated. Reagan brilliantly used Volcker in a political way. Volcker stopped inflation, not Reagan, and enabled Reagan to cut, tax, cut taxes. Reagan never publicly criticized Volcker, even though his, uh, even though his aides, his uh, henchmen, were, uh, to say they were angry at Volcker is an understatement. In that same period, the takeover wizards took off. Joe Flom, a great, brilliant lawyer, was the leader of the takeover movement. He taught investment bankers what to do. He learned it early on. The takeovers got bigger and bigger. They were financed by bank debt and junk bonds. People made billions, and they got sillier and sillier. And people made more and more billions. Nobody in government stopped them. Nobody. Volcker thought it was getting out of hand. Remember, those loans they made, the interest on those loans they made were tax deductible. The Fed had a right to demand margin requirements on those investments in stocks. The Fed under Bob Volcker was not a dictator in this Fed, and they refused to go along with him. It's one of the reasons Reagan wanted Volcker out of there by his second term, and he succeeded. The interesting history here is that the takeover movement began to be, was the great instigator of short-termism in uh, the management of companies. 
when companies were taken over, the first order of business usually was to cut expenses. And that usually meant labor. To some degree, it meant R&D in order to get short-term profits up, in order to get earnings per share up and get that stock price up. Now, how do you get those CEOs to do it or the people who took over to do it? You give them a lot of stock options. Well, there was an economic theory about that, too. I emphasize the words economic ignorance, an economic theory that that would motivate CEOs best. In fact, it made them much more short-term oriented and much more oriented towards cutting labor and reducing wages over this period. Now, Jack Welch took over in 1980, took over General Electric. He was a whiz kid. He was a, t a man with a terrible temper. People didn't like him, but he was brilliant in many ways, charismatic in many ways, and his predecessor decided to make him head of GE in 1980. That was around the period takeover, the takeover movement was starting to get really hot. And Jack Welch, number one, didn't want to be taken over, and number two, wanted to get his stock price up. He basically adopted the strategies of those takeover artists. Get labor costs down, get return on equity up, don't take big chances in R&D, don't make ne necessarily put all your eggs on making great products, worry about that stock price. Well, the great thing that happened, of course, was there was a bull market in stocks that began in 1982 and really didn't end till the year 2000, the end of the stock market, the te high tech boom. And this uh, influenced Jack Welch's quite harsh labor decisions. And ultimately, Jack Welch, one of the great ironies about President Obama bringing in Jeffrey Immelt, head of General Electric, to tell him how the industrial economy worked, is that Jack Welch turned General Electric basically into a bank, not an industrial company. He got rid of much of that, and half of the profits of GE in the later years came from his banking institution, and they had to get some money, some federal bailout money, in the end. That was ultimately the result of Jack Welch's attitudes, driven by Wall Street, I believe, ultimately. This takeover attitude, this takeover mentality, get short-term profits up. The LBOs took off, leverage buyouts took off in that period. Independent private firms borrowing gobs of money to take over public companies, naming new management, giving, giving them lots of stock options, getting short-term profits up. The best research on those hostile takeovers, and by the 1980s they began to total hundreds of billions of dollars and they were even larger in the 1990s. The best research on that shows those takeovers by and large were failures, except for the guys who engineered them, the takeover specialists many of whom you see on the Forbes 400 list. Somebody asked me today, you know, uh, I think I have it in the book, um, used to be that you didn't get that rich on, on Wall Street. Used to make a good living. The famous story was J.P. Morgan, who was indeed the greatest banker of the time, the dominant banker in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, who basically rescued America in that period. And when he died, I believe, don't hold me to this, but I believe it was Carnegie when they looked at the money he left. Carnegie, who said, I didn't know he was such a poor man. <laughs> they think Carnegie might have had a billion dollars to J.P. Morgan's mere 80 million. But it was in this period that huge Wall Street fortunes started to be made. The LBO artists eventually the hedge fund managers. They take up, took a big piece of this huge uh, growing market, these huge transactions. Billionaires were not made on Wall Street before. Billionaires were an industry. Billionaires were people like in, in later times like uh, Bill Gates, who built companies. They weren't people who engineered profits through, and I think it's fair to call it, paper shuffling that in the end looked like an enormous waste uh, of money. SNLs and junk bonds. Junk bonds is kind of a, an interesting province. It was uh, initiated and, uh, and, and uh, advocated and uh, grown to extraordinary heights by Mike Milken, as we all know. It was a, almost a totally unregulated market. Um, Milken could not, it's not necessarily true that Milken did outright illegal things 
most of the time. But those things he did do couldn't have been done in markets for other kinds of securities. He was the buyer, the seller, and the middleman, and I am not exaggerating. I'm not even being metaphorical. That's literally the truth. And often it's pretty well documented that he took pieces that he did not disclose, or so it's, I better be careful, so it's alleged, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, the allegations are pretty clear. In any case, the junk bonds financed those great takeovers. The junk bonds financed lots of bad companies and a couple of good ones. I love, sometimes you talk to financiers who are still, of course, uh, apologists for that great period. So all those great companies, I spoke to one recently, all those, uh, or a couple of years ago, all those great companies, Milk and Finance, I said, now which ones? Give me a list. And he said, you know, let me think about it a little bit. I'll get back to you. There, there were some that worked out. Lots of them made no sense at all and were held aloft by debt. Uh, uh, and uh, lots of bad takeovers were made as a consequence of the availability of junk bond financing. Milken got to a point where his signature literally created money. It was quite an extraordinary moment in Wall Street history. What it didn't do particularly was create great investments. It was also an example of the kind of financing we need because the stock market, while rising in the 1980s, still wasn't there, still wasn't providing the equity financing we could have used. The now, let me get to the 1990s. That is the decade of deceit. That is the decade of corruption. And I would say 1% or so of Americans have any historical sense of how bad things were back then. Uh, we could go through a long list. The subprime market really started back then. Remember the money store and the great Phil Rizzuto, one of my boyhood idols, and uh, those were pretty, pretty, uh, pretty questionable companies. They were basically subprime mortgages they were issuing, or bad debt, or payday loans, stuff like that. But that was the least of it. Compa big companies, bankers trust, was doing derivative financing for the likes of Procter & Gamble and Orange County. Those poor guys, even at Procter & Gamble, but the controller of Orange County thought he was a hot shot. He was getting lower uh, borrowing costs. And it was Bankers Trust, after all, a big bank doing it. Had to be safe, didn't it? No. 1994, Alan Greenspan raised interest rates, and those securities tanked. Orange County lost a billion dollars and went bankrupt. Procter & Gamble lost 200 or $300 million. The SEC sued, it might have been Bankers Trust, it's in my book, so it can be checked. Uh, remember, Orange County lost a billion, P&G lost 200 to 300 million. Bankers Trust was fined $4 million. Nobody went to jail. I think the Comptroller in Orange County went to jail for a few minutes. Uh, poor guy. <laughs> That was by no means the only thing that went on in the, in the 1990s. Now, the reason that could happen is Alan Greenspan let it happen. Alan Greenspan let the banks, he started ending Glass-Steagall in the late 1980s. Glass-Steagall was the New Deal legislation that separated commercial banks from investment banks because there was a natural conflict of interest. If you were going to lend to a company and also raise equity money for a company or have uh, have customers who are investing in that company, there was a normal conflict of interest. You would lend more money to that company if it was in some trouble. You'd start making bad decisions and vice versa. You'd have a lot of conflicting information. You'd try and overlook problems and so forth. They were separated. Alan Greenspan said, nonsense, competition works. He didn't use the words Milton Friedman, but it was the same idea. They will, do, they will ultimately do the right thing so you let Bankers Trust do all this derivative financing. Uh, and there were other companies that did it. A bank in the South, very aggressive, also got fined a trivial amount of money. But that was not the big thing that happened in the 1990s. There were many other big things that happened in the 1990s. Accounting fraud after accounting fraud, culminating in Enron, supported by the most prestigious accountants in America, backed in turn by the lawyers who approved, often approved, what the accountants were doing. The high technology boom, one crazy fantasy after another, and analysts on Wall Street were forced to lie to their customers, 
to lie to their customers if they wanted to keep that job. It's well documented. People finally fessed up. Arthur Levitt, the SEC chairman appointed by the Democrats, even finally woke up after the fact and tried to stop some of that. They lied. Then there was market manipulation. We've seen some of it already with this new offer for LinkedIn. Um, underpricing IPOs, initial public offerings, overpricing initial public offerings, uh, a, a secret opaque pricing of these securities. On and on it went. Um, the uh, uh, high-tech fantasy basically began with Netscape and by 2000 the market I think lost, stock market lost three trillion dollars in assets. Of course it was the age of Enron and WorldCom also. Who were the big lenders to Enron and WorldCom? JP Morgan, Chase, JP Morgan Chase, uh, Citigroup which was now combined with Sandy Wiles operation, lent them all kinds of money, looked the other way, helped them structure secret partnerships, Lots of smart people were caught in that as well. What a decade. I would argue that there's no easy way to measure it, that it was the most corrupt decade since the 1920s and probably on a par with the 1920s. And when, while we all sit back and know the 1920s were corrupt, we don't all sit back and know the 1990s were corrupt. In fact, I remember giving talks then when, that in 1997, the East Asian countries collapsed, partly for lack of capital controls, again, abdication of government responsibility, supported by Democrats, most vociferously by Larry Summers, the former Harvard economist, and now a Harvard economist again. Uh, think twice about sending your kid to Harvard. <laughs> and, uh, those con and, and what did people say? Uh, crony capitalism, corrupt countries. What kinds of countries are they? We don't know what their accounting is like. We don't know what they're up to. Meantime, what do we have going on? Long-term capital management, lying on Wall Street about high technology companies, accounting frauds that are ultimately numbered in the hundreds in major companies. Long-term capital management was about to go under. The Fed engineered Long-term capital management was that very fancy hedge fund that got very cocky and uh, really stopped following its own rules. I talk about that at some length in the book. Um, Alan, uh, Alan Greenspan decided he had to engineer some kind of private rescue. Was anything learned by Alan Greenspan as a consequence of that? No. Were any disclosure requirements adopted about hedge funds? After that, no. Greenspan said, well, basically the market worked. We saved the darn guys. We know what we're doing. On to the next act. We had crisis after crisis. We had the Mexican crisis of 1982. Uh, the, the South American loans that went bad. We had the stock market crash of 1987. Greenspan had just taken over the Federal Reserve from Paul Volcker at that point, and he stepped on the gas correctly, and he saved the day, and everybody thought he was brilliant thereafter. But a huge crash it was, and the consequences were still borne out. We were led to big bad debt. The junk bond market failed in 1989. The SNLs failed and had to be rescued by the federal government in 1989, 1990 to the tune of 150 to 200 billion dollars. But that wasn't the real damage they did. The real damage they did was to undermine the economy. Then in 1994, I don't think many people remember this at all, but I mentioned it, Greenspan rose int raised interest rates. Again, there was a chaos on Wall Street because of all this fancy stuff. Then again, in 1997, long-term capital management, the East Asian crisis, and then the Russian defaults, 1997-1998. One crisis after another. Then the 2000 stock market crash. And we haven't even gotten to the mortgage nonsense of the 2000s yet. And people think this all just happened now. And what, it, it, uh, and what did Greenspan have the audacity to say after the mortgage crisis when everybody said, wow, he's finally admitting he doesn't know everything. 
He said, you know, my model worked for 40 years, but I realized something was wrong with it, finally. <laughs> Guess what? His model did not work for 40 years. He saved the day time and again, but investment was wasted time and again. In those bad loans to the third world, the derivative investments, the SNL investments, the junk bonds, the takeovers, the high tech fantasies, the WorldCom um, telecom fantasies, time and again. Now, Greenspan and Summers, if he were here, would just laugh. He'd say, Where did you get your degree? He'd, he'd, they'd say, We know that we have to give financial markets their license to over speculate so that we could get the good side of speculation, the benefits of investment. Well, what happened in the last 40 years? <coughs> Productivity failed to grow rapidly the way it did in the 1950s and 60s, except for a few years in the late 1990s and a few rather dubious years in the 2000s. Capital investment, the engine of future growth, was relatively weak almost throughout this period as a proportion of gross domestic product, as a proportion of national income, and wages. I mean, what is an economy for but to raise the standard of living of its people? Wages did not rise or rose barely over 40 years. And male wages, the median male worker, the typical male worker today, makes less after inflation than the typical worker of 1969 makes. Now, why do we think we succeeded in this period? What was going on? And then, I don't even know if I have to talk about the mortgage and housing crisis too much, but it was basically driven. Now, there's a lot of talk about how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac contributed, or were even the prime causes of this. The anti-government forces came right out of the gate the minute we had a crash and said, government did it. Government did it. Well, the fact is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac did contribute to this crisis. It was crazy that they had a quasi-government guarantee on their loans. What was even crazier was, in obeisance to this new free market ideology, they were made private companies and their management was given bonuses dependent on the profits they made. So they were following much of the same private motivation as the rest of Wall Street. But even so, even in their worst year, they bought a minority uh, of subprime loans. And the Fed, uh, Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission concluded this. There were six democratically appointed members and five Republican appointed members. Four of those Republicans sided with the six Democrats and said, yes, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac contributed to the problem, but they were not the prime cause. Four out of those five Republicans. The prime cause was excess on Wall Street. We can go into that and spend a long time going into that. I'm not going to except to say this. Collateralized debt obligations are a product that should probably be outlawed. At the least, so-called synthetic collateralized debt obligations, which is the source of all this talk about Goldman Sachs's deceptions of its customers, should probably be outlawed. They are products that are too easy to manipulate and deceive with. I realize I'm getting pretty close to the end of the hour, and I only have another hour to go. You know, there's that... Uh, <laughs> I probably said this to all of you before, but there's this famous Galbraith line, when you're about halfway through, you tell people you're coming to the close, and they get uh, a little less impatient. But um, I, I have to talk a little bit about what's coming next, uh, because my wife told me I have to talk about it. <laughs> she's out there, and she's almost always right, actually. Do we have a program for the future? How far gone are we? I think we're probably pretty far gone. I know that strikes the American uh, conscien conscience in the wrong way. I know, 
I'm constantly lectured about this kind of thing. But we've neglected our infrastructure, we've neglected our education in the sense that it's now highly unequal depending on uh, your, your life circumstances. We've neglected to reform health care. We've neglected broadband. We've neglected energy investments. But maybe uh, as important, all this misallocation of capital neglected useful R&D, manufacturing R&D, R&D that could create jobs in America. So what can we do? We are really in a mess with this so-called austerity economics that unfortunately President Obama joined uh, enthusiastically, joined this debate enthusiastically, and which some very wealthy people have promoted enthusiastically. The, a future program needs the following, I think. It needs true financial regulations. Dodd-Frank is not good enough. Dodd-Frank has some good things. There was much too much emphasis on the too big to fail phenomenon. Just as an aside, by the way, in 1982 when Paul Volcker and the IMF held bail out the banks in the Mexican crisis, too big to fail was all the headlines also. It wasn't that American bankers lent too much money to South America. It was that this handful of big banks lent, lent all this money. Just an aside. This thing just keeps repeating and repeating. What would true financial regulation... What's the real problem? The real problem was over-speculation, manipulation of the markets, and asymmetric um, uh, incentives to take risk. People were encouraged to take risk and didn't bear the losses. Uh, that's partly because most of these companies became shareholder-owned companies. It used to be in the old days they were partnerships. But it's partly because there was no serious regulation out there uh, to make sure incentives were aligned. Speculation could be controlled by much more serious capital requirements. It's not. Leverage requirements should be uh, enforced. It was not. In fact, in 2004, the SEC reduced leverage requirements. We've got to start controlling this uh, speculation, and that includes making all markets open and transparent. The irony of what happened is that the spirit of the New Deal was forgotten. One of the basic facts in the New Deal, one of the basic philosophies, was to, to require disclosure on the part of the investment banks and the securities firms when they issued new securities. We forgot that under Greenspan and others. We did not require disclosure of derivatives trading. We did not dis require serious disclosure of these impossibly complex collateralized debt obligations. Out the window. FDIC was probably the most successful program of the New Deal and part of the Glass-Steagall. The insurance on savers so that they didn't r rush to take their money out wh when a calamity struck. Money market funds were created in the 1970s as part of that great changing environment I discussed. Uh, but nobody thought that those money market funds should be insured. I bet no one here keeps their money in a savings account except, uh, well, I think I'm guilty of that. But except a few foolish people, it's always in a money market account somewhere. People don't think it had to be insured. The government in 2007 and 2008, the Fed plus the Treasury had to guarantee something like $2 trillion in deposits suddenly. On and on. We need financial regulations that really hit this target. Let me say one other thing, and it's the most controversial thing I'll say. Wall, Wall Street is an oligopoly. It's a monopoly. They get seven bucks for every hundred dollars of money they raise for an IPO. When you make those kind of fees, you'll just sell anything. And they do sell anything. And this is not the first time it happened. The reason Riston made all those loans to South America before the government could stop him, really, before they had a chance, and under the Nixon and then Ford administration, they wouldn't have, but because they made huge fees. It wasn't only the gap between the money, that, uh, the money they charge in interest and the money that they had to pay their savers for their, uh, for their funds. They got a piece of the action of every loan, one or two percent in fact, made huge fees. It's time to think about limiting those fees, just like we limit electricity prices or water prices if there is a monopoly. Uh, that's a pretty big, bold statement. Uh, 
but I think it's probably the only way we'll get back to getting finance to do what it's supposed to do. So that's the number one issue. Get finance back to making productive investment and challenge channeling precious resources where they must go. And that has not even been a thought in the minds of the reformers, the Obama administration, Dodd, the Dodd-Frank people, and so on. It was all about too big to fail. It was all about putting their finger in the holes in the dike and the dam. There was no general intellectual philosophy. Two, tax. We are a low-taxed country. Let's face it. And do lower taxes work? Here's my favorite example. We had the Bush tax cuts, aggressively supported by Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, and it was none of his darn business, but he did it anyway, using his great reputation then. Since those tax cuts, America has had the slowest rate of GDP growth, 2001 to 2007. I'm not including the crisis and the recession before the crisis and recession. The slowest rate of income growth of any expansion, bottom to top, in the post-World War II era. Tax cuts, slowest GDP growth. I was at the Bush Institute, I said that recently, to a bunch of people. Uh, I think all of whom disagreed with me vehemently. Water off a duck's back. Cut taxes even more. You've heard the number, right? The top 400 richest people in America pay 18% eight, tax rate. 18% tax rate. Companies now pay about one third in taxes, mostly because of loopholes, compared to what they did 20 or 30 years ago. Bad budget balancing, forget it. Fix health care. Health care is the issue with the long-term budget problem. Medicare and Medicaid is being driven by rapid increases in health care costs. All of those big ballooning scary numbers, it's all Medicare and Medicaid. It's not Social Security. And Medicare and Medicaid are not rising inevitably because we're getting older. That contributes to it. But the big issue is health care costs, fixed health care. And we need a jobs program. We've had, a, we had no job creation in the 2000s, even during the expansion. No job creation and reductions in wages. We, don't, we aren't getting it. I think people are feeling it. I don't know if they're feeling it in the White House. And in a Democratic White House, in my view, that's where we should be feeling it. Here's my greatest fear, and I'll wrap up with this. We haven't paid the biggest price yet on the neglect of the economy. I leave you with that optimistic thought. <laughs> we have not created the foundation for future prosperity. We have not refocused the financial industry towards doing what it's supposed to do. We worry about avoiding the next crash. That's only part of it and not even the biggest part of it. My concern is this. Unless we begin to realize that business competition is only part of what a society can be. And business competition can be magic. And business has been magic in America. But until it's aligned with the cooperation sphere, until we begin dealing with our transportation system, our energy and environmental problems, how to spend adequate money on R&D, how to deal with our water problems, we're going to be in trouble. And you know what? The other models, the models in the world that will prosper, the country models that will prosper, do this kind of thing. The cooperation circle and the free competition circle overlap. There is a recognition that this is ideological, dangerous, and is not going to lead to maximum prosperity, social equity, or social justice in the way we know it. I think we're probably threatened. Thanks for listening to me.